A month ago, I posted this meme about how brass players are lazy, you know, and they don't like to play a lot of notes. They like a lot of rests, which is pedagogically sound because you should rest as much as you play. You should check out my videos on developing your endurance and your range. But the music in the background of that meme was actually Arbin's characteristic study number one, which is a very common etude for us brass players. And our trombone player, Soren, commented on said video saying that I should do a recording of it. And uh, I don't want to. Well, Soren was actually supposed to do our video for this week, and then he came up with some excuse for why he couldn't do the video. Uh, I'm in the hospital, and uh, whatever. So, I'm gonna do a video this week. I woke up this morning, taught my lessons for the day, came home, and had the idea to do a tutorial on how to play Arbin Characteristic Study number one. There is no script, there is no plan, I am fueled on nothing but stock, cold brew, and Panera bread. My face is tired, and I'm reminded of one of my favorite biblical quotes. I believe it was Jesus who said, this is gonna get me in trouble. The mind is willing, but the body is weak and spongy, much like a Twinkie. Let's talk about how to play Arbin Characteristic Study number one. I think there's an intro in there somewhere. <laughs> And now there's a dog in here, because why, why not, you know? He's just trying to record a video, and there's a thunderstorm, so of course the dog comes in. All right, since we are an educational nonprofit, you'd better be expecting a little history lesson on who Jean-Baptiste Arban is. But if you are just looking for tips on how to play Arban Characteristic Study Number 1, I'll probably link timestamps in the description. This ain't my first rodeo. The best way for me to tell you the history of Jean-Baptiste Arban is to read to you from an essay that I wrote for my graduate studies called Arbin, the Cornet, and Chromatic Brass in the French Orchestra. I will now read to you from my essay. This is the level of content we're doing now. <laughs> Jean-Baptiste Alban is arguably the most influential figure in the development of cornet and trumpet pedagogy. I'm going to beg to differ with myself. The guy who first discovered a hollow orifice and decided to go into it is probably the most influential person in all of brass pedagogy and does not get his due. But back to Arbin. Born in Lyons, France in 1825, Arbin grew up with an interest in music, specifically that of military bands. After beginning his study of music theory, Arbin selected his primary instrument, the cornopian. The study of the cornopian would lead Arbin to go on to study the trumpet at the Paris Conservatory under the tutelage of Francois Dauvernier. I hope I said that right. From 1841 to 1845. In 1856, Arbin had found success as a conductor by directing salon orchestras, which eventually led him to conducting the opera. He was appointed the professor of sax horn, an invention of Adolf Sax, who invented the saxophone, for military bands at the École Militaire in 1857. However, with cornet developing a growing popularity in Parisian brass ensembles, Arbin took it upon himself to advocate for education in cornet technique at the conservatory level. In 1869, seven years after his first failed request, the Paris Conservatory approved the implementation of a cornet studio separate from that of the trumpet studio. Arbin would resign from his post at the conservatory in 1874 to conduct a French orchestra in St. Petersburg. Arbin returned to his position at the conservatory in 1880, where he would devote the rest of his life to teaching and improving upon the designs of valved brass instruments. Jean-Baptiste Arban died on April 9, 1889 in Paris, France. Now, if you are a brass player, maybe you play trumpet, trombone, euphonium, you've probably heard of Arbin's Complete Conservatory Method. It's a book that's about that thick. Most of the time it has a red cover, and it has all different kinds of exercises for you to develop your technique as a brass player. Arbin's Complete Conservatory Method for the Cornet is one of the seminal texts in trumpet literature. The inception of this method book came at a time when no such text existed. Arbin had compiled all of the exercises that he had written for his students at the conservatory. As for why Arbin decided to compile his own method book, he stated in the preface, yeah, read your prefaces. The cornet à pistons, let me try that again, the cornet à pistons, as well as the flute, the clarinet, the violin, 
and the voice should possess the pure style and the grand method of which a few professors at the conservatory in particular have conserved the precious secrets and salutary traditions. Nailed it. This text would go on to be referred to as Arben's Method for the Cornet and was published in Paris in 1864. In time, Arben's method was adopted by the Conservatory with the Conservatory Committee of Musical Studies writing. The Committee of Musical Studies of the Paris Conservatory has examined the method which was submitted by Mr. Arben. This sensible development is found on excellent principles, omits no teaching essential to making a good cornetist. It is actually a resume of the knowledge acquired by the author's long experience as a professor and executant, and also the exceptional results which have marked his career. In this wealthy mine of instruction where all musical questions are treated, we can readily observe Mr. Arben's profound knowledge of the difficulties and skills in overcoming them. The committee desires to congratulate Mr. Arben and will adopt his method of instruction at the Paris Conservatory. Thus, the merits of Arben's comprehensive method were seen at its inception and the text remains in the canon of cornet and trumpet pedagogy to this day. So it's an important book. Could you sit up? Good? You feel good? Ugh, you stink. Arben saw the development of a chromatic brass instrument like the cornet as an opportunity to bring trumpet playing to a virtuosic level on the same playing field as the violin, the clarinet, or the flute. In fact, he was so inspired by one of his contemporaries, Niccolo Paganini, a violin virtuoso, who did his own theme and variations on a folk tune called O Mama Mama Cara, which you might know as Carnival of Venice, that Arben made his own theme and variation on Carnival of Venice, which inspired many cornet players to write versions of Carnival of Venice. If you want to read more about Carnival of Venice, you can read my thesis. That's the weirdest YouTube pitch of all time. Most YouTube pitches are for better help or hello fresh, but I want you to read my thesis. With that in mind, knowing that Arben wanted to push the virtuosity of cornetists and trumpet players, the characteristic studies in his book are designed to push the ability of trumpet players across multiple different fields of technique. Let's take a look at characteristic study number one to see what techniques we might be dealing with. <laughs> The primary technique being worked throughout this entire etude is the ability to navigate all ranges of the horn in all different articulations. There are all kinds of different articulation patterns throughout this etude. We slur into staccatos, we slur entire passages, we tongue entire passages. There are even some really awkward slur three, tongue one, tongue three. It looks like a tongue one, slur two, tongue two, slur two, tongue one, slur two, tongue two, slur two, slur two. So, watch out. But beyond working our ability to play in the low register, middle register, and upper register with different articulation patterns, this etude works a couple different things that you might not actually be thinking about in your playing. One is simply the ability to play in multiple different keys. Our etude begins in C major and is in fact in C major for about the first half of the page until we start getting some chromatic notes and a little bit of an interval study that Arben throws in there and we begin to modulate to the key of E flat major. We even end a phrase on a big E flat major chord. Now if you know your key signatures and you know a little bit of your music theory, E flat major is the relative major to C minor, and C minor is the parallel major blah, and C minor is the parallel minor to C major, the key that we started the etude in. So we start the second half of this etude in the key of C minor. As we play through this development section, Arben gives us a C sharp fully diminished 7 chord. Now this chord creates a lot of tension. And theoretically speaking, the chord has a natural pull to the key of D major. And what do you know? Two bars later, we are in the key of D major, where for about four measures, we're just bouncing between the one chord and the five chord in D major. Arben then uses the D major chord as a secondary dominant to get us into the key of G major. 
which Arbin uses the exact same type of modulation by secondary dominant to get from G major at the end of the page back to C major with a da capo. And you play the entire opening up to the fine, and that's the piece. So let's count the keys. C major, E flat, kind of, but really C minor, so we'll say both. D major, G major, back to C major. Also present in this etude are a couple different ornamentations, which we'll talk about when we get to them. But we have some trills, and we have what we call turns present in this etude. And another thing Arben loves to do in his solo rep and etudes are wide interval leaps between melody notes and then sort of decorative notes underneath. And that's basically all the technique present in this etude. As with any piece, it's best that you start learning slowly. I talk a lot about how to prepare your music in this video that I made on how to prepare for a recital. So if you want more tips on how to prepare music for a performance, I suggest you click on the link up in the cards. Now in addition to approaching this piece slowly, I suggest you also approach this piece at a softer dynamic. This etude was written for the cornet. Now if you want to learn a little bit more about the cornet, you can check out this video that I made about all the different instruments in my collection that I use and why I use them. But basically the cornet is meant to be a lighter, more melodic instrument compared to the trumpet, which we can use for big, powerful fanfares. So this etude should be light and delicate. You shouldn't be thinking marching band or big band or back of the orchestra playing fanfares. This is delicate, virtuosic stuff. Think more violin concerto, clarinet solo, flute solo. That's what Arben really wants us to start sounding like on our instrument. Learning to play lightly and delicately has so many benefits for our trumpet playing. Not only will it give us more colors to create our music with, it's actually going to help us develop the coordination that we need to go between the lower register and the upper register, which Arben has us do a lot in this etude. And my final piece of advice for you guys is to break this piece down into sections. Each section is going to work different parts of your playing. Here is how I like to divide this piece up. Let's start at the top. Our etude begins with a series of ascending C major arpeggios followed by a descending scale in thirds. Again, you're going to want to practice these slowly so you can work on your coordination and accuracy instead of just your brute force. In the second line of this etude, we get two different trills, one on a C sharp and one on a D sharp. Now, for those of you who have never done a trill before, let me break it down for you. I like to start my trills in a more Baroque style, where we start on the upper neighbor tone. The upper neighbor tone to our C sharp is going to be D natural. So I'll start on D natural, and then I'll start trilling. Now how long I trill is determined by the rhythmic value of the note I'm trilling on. So in this case, I'm trilling on a half note. That means I've got two beats to wiggle my fingers. But before you just start wiggling your fingers, you're going to want to measure out your trill. As you can see in the etude, there's actually a series of grace notes that we have to place at the end of the trill to get us to the downbeat of the next measure. So thinking through rhythmically, I want to go one and two. Da -ga -da. For our D sharp trill, we're going to start on our upper neighbor tone, which in this case is E natural. And we're going to repeat the process, measuring out our finger wiggles so that we can land those grace notes to propel us into the downbeat of the next measure. Now what makes the next couple measures a little bit tricky is the placement of the starts of our phrases. A lot of these start on the second 16th note of each grouping, which if you use one E and O would be the E and a. Or if you use something like Takadimi, which I like, it would be the Kadimi. But considering everything is running 16th notes, it can be easy for you to lose sight of where that phrase starts and ends because it is so continuous. It might behoove you to add an accent to these Ianda Kadimi figures 
just so that you can help keep track of where the phrases start. Our next main phrase following a double bar is this descending triplet scalar pattern that turns into yet another C arpeggio. I want you to really focus on playing this passage with as minimal facial movement as you can make. What helps me play this passage is thinking about my tongue arch starting at the top of my scale as I descend downwards. This takes a lot of burden off of my embouchure muscles and makes this easier for me to play. Also, one of the most unexpectedly difficult notes to play is the F at the top of the staff, that's marked forte, coming off of our little descending scale after we went up for that high A. We have an interval of a minor seventh, which can be kind of difficult for you to hear and anticipate. So I suggest you spend some time just practicing jumping from that middle G up to the F at the top of the staff. Once you've gotten good at playing that middle G up to the F relatively in time, go ahead and practice the transition between measures. Start with your ascending C major arpeggio, and then just play the first note of the next measure, just to make sure we're landing it and hearing it properly. The next phrase of the etude is something Arbin loves to do, and it's what I like to call a pedal point. Essentially what Arben has us doing is playing a melody at the top of the staff that he's ornamenting with this middle G that he has us keep jumping down to. So one way to practice this is to take out that middle G entirely so you can hear what the melody is supposed to sound like. Once you've gotten good at that, go ahead and add that middle G back in. Really focus on quickly speeding up that air so you can get that top melody note to come out. And here's where we begin to modulate to E flat major slash C minor. I think this section is really fun for you to play around with some rubato when you're playing, meaning you get to play around with note duration a little bit. I think the minor key lends itself to a little bit more drama, so you can have a little bit more fun with it. Now about three measures into this key change, you'll notice this little squiggly symbol with an accidental beneath it, and that is another ornament called the turn. You may have experienced turns in your jazz music before, but if you've never gotten a good definition of what a turn is, essentially it's a series of upper and lower neighbor tones surrounding a chord tone. Our first chord tone we have is a G. Our upper neighbor tone would be an A, and our lower neighbor tone would be F. But take note of the accidental beneath our little squiggle, our turn symbol. That accidental is a sharp. That tells me that the lower neighbor tone should be F sharp. As with our trills, there's a little bit of math and measuring we have to do. Before you add in your turn, make sure you're being diligent about your dotted eighth sixteenth figure. This way when you add in your turn, your rhythm is still going to be accurate. Then we get to play around in the turbulence of C minor until we land on a C sharp fully diminished 7 chord, which is acting as a leading tone chord into the key of D major. <laughs>
Now this D major section is short. It is only four measures long. And for those four measures, you're just outlining D major and A major arpeggios. And at the end of that fourth measure, Arben uses the D major arpeggio as a secondary dominant to modulate to the key of G major. This G major section is very cornetti. It's very fun to play. I'm pretty sure when I recorded it for this video, my tempo increased like five clicks because once you get it under your fingers, it's a lot of fun to play. This is also where we get the lowest note of the piece where Arben brings us all the way down to our low F sharp. So as you descend to that note, make sure you're putting a little bit of extra space between your top and bottom teeth lower your jaw a little bit that's going to give you the space in your oral cavity to play that low f sharp and have it come out now the trickiest part of this g major section dare i say the entire piece is the fourth measure where you have what's basically a descending chromatic scale but with all these extra neighbor tones it can be kind of hard to navigate i suggest you practice it not only slowly but also with a swing pattern Adding that swing is going to let your fingers learn the pattern in a different way and help develop that muscle memory. Now in the seventh measure of this G major section, Arben includes a blink and you miss it interval study where he outlines a D dominant seven chord. The D dominant seventh chord is outlined by the strong beats of each of these 16th note groupings. And because it's Arben, of course he's going to have you jump up some awkward interval to play some silly ornamentation, but hey, that's Arben. Our G major section ends with a G dominant 7th chord, another secondary dominant, which leads us back to the top of the piece where we play up to the fine. <laughs> Now, if you're looking for some tips on how to improve your efficiency and ability to navigate the range of your instrument, I highly suggest you watch the next video. Thank you.